Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And uh, this week, we're going to be taking a look at policing. We're going to be taking a look at missing excavators, galamse, and perhaps a few other issues. Welcome to Talk Time. Hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated from the very beginning, this week, we're going to be taking a look at policing. We're going to be looking at missing excavators, galamse, and other related issues. And we have the privilege of talking to a retired superintendent of police, uh, Peter Lancini Toby. He's currently vying for a parliamentary seat, but that is not our concern today. Our concern today it's about his experiences as a policeman. Sir, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you very much, my brother. Yes, sir. Now, sir, how long were you in the police service? I've served for 25 years, from 1993 to 2019. So. This is also the period in which Galamse grew and became a national problem. That is right. As a police officer, were you ever involved? In, in the attempt to curb this practice. Thank you very much. Let me first of all say um, a fine good evening to our wonderful viewers. Galamse, I would say, has been with us for ages even before I joined the police. You know, naturally, if a practice is part of society, it becomes cultural. But if that particular practice becomes offensive to the collective conscience of the people. Sometimes we, we just enact laws to stop it. So at a point in time, laws were passed to prevent people from mining, I would always say, any howling. Right? So from 1993, when I joined the police, I visited friends who were involved in what we call Galamse now. And it was seen as a very normal practice for people who were lucky to find themselves in areas that are endowed with gold. But we found later that the devastating effect on the environment could not be compromised. So there were stringent laws passed to prevent it, from prevent its continuation. I think that with time, several attempts by various governments have been made to see if we can stop it. And the last one actually was a 2017 one by President Nanado. What is some of the previous attempts which were made you know, to stop the spread of Galamse? And um, in the past, district assemblies tried their best within their own limitation to stop it. Even some of the chiefs that felt that this menace is having a negative impact on our water bodies tried to stop it. Some of the international organizations, NGOs, all got involved. But I think it gained national currency during the time of um, uh, President Mahama that we had a whole setup to see how this particular menace could be dealt with. They have done the best that they could, but they realized that it just needed a national consensus. It wasn't an issue for government to sit in the room and decide that let's do this or that. All Ghanaians must come on board and agree that this is a menace that has a negative effect on us. And I'm sure if we don't do it, deal with it, posterity will hold all of us responsible. And I believe in those days, I remember some of the statements that were made expressing the, the, the challenge in fighting the difficult challenge in fighting illegal mining. So for me, I think in, in 2017, before 2017, when President Arnaldo was campaigning, he made it very clear. And I think that pronounced statement became so popular with us. In two, he says, yet it's a castle and a come day. And that was true. Ghana is on, on, on sitting on money. Everywhere is gold. You know, in my own hometown, nobody knew that we could ever get gold. In Dury, nobody knew we could ever get gold in Poyen Tanga, or nobody even knew we were going to get gold around Bole area. Gold was all about Obuasi, Takuradi, Dabuasi, and the rest from, from childhood. We've come to realize that gold is everywhere in Ghana. And you know what? Many of the young people on their own have done working, they've identified places, and in fact, they've explored, and they've, they've, been, begin, they've begun dealing with the matter as if it's a personal matter. Today, we've come to realize that gold is everywhere. So for that matter, mining can be done anywhere. It has to be regulated. So when the president said, we're really sitting on money and we're hungry, everybody applauded it. 
then we came up with this issue of getting operation vanguard that is the, the security angle before we come to vanguard I mean, what are some of the specific measures which were taken by previous administrations to deal with this menace previous administrations i can remember so well they got the police involved right they tried as much as possible to talk to people who were getting involved in galancy they rolled out an education program to educate people but this is a, it's a situa situation of livelihood. People want to earn their livelihood. People are in there to make money. So if there is no alternative, and you just ask them, please stop, this is devastating to our environment. Oh, yes, we understand. <laughs> but if you get to, care to know, I am hungry. If you care to know, I need money to pay my school fees. If you care to know, they have, they have examples of somebody probably completing senior high school on his own. I've been able to manage to save enough money from Galamse to go to the university without going begging. So if you talk to such a young man, stop Galamse, he will look at you and say, well, I think that is a good thing to listen to you, but what is the alternative? If you don't have alternative, they may try to just stop it for the meantime to see what you can do. If there is no way out for an alternative, they will go back to where they have to live a life or make a living. So people who are digging gold or who have dug gold, can they really be said to be eking out a living? Gold. It's money. Lots of money. And lots of money. Yeah. And that is how come, if you find a young man who is just trying to get 1,000 Ghana City to, to, to sort out himself in terms of school fees, all of a sudden you find him riding a brand new motorbike. That costs him 4,000, 5,000 Ghana cities. And he can actually come home with more money than ever before. And it's all from Galamse. You realize that there is some level of dynamism in the game. Things are changing. So I have enough to even spare my family. I have enough to even take care of my, my poor father and mother. So it is a way to go. If somebody thinks that, yes, it's good to make the money, but the money you are making has a replica effect on society as a whole. So let's look at it. It has to be a national debate. And that is why some of us were quite excited when broadly defined, we came out to see if we can fight Galamse head on in 2017. But obviously the measures that previous governments took were not successful. They were not successful. And that is why, for me, best practices over years. Why were they not successful? I believe that the president reviewed such, excuse me, such challenges and came out with a policy that was going to be better. So some of us felt that this time around, having looked at the past, or in fact gone into history, if you are rolling out a policy, the policy should have hindsight believing in the fact that this one can be different. Was there anything different about this approach, Operation Vanguard and so on, to other efforts which were made in the past? Was there any difference? Personally, I have not seen any difference. No, in terms of strategy, in terms of yeah, oh, sure. vision and so on. What, what I realize with the current approach is the fact that They've analyzed the situation. I'm sure they've, they've read the history. And they decided that let's go into community mining. Fighting Galamse was not a fight to stop people from mining. It was a fight to sanitize the industry. That was my understanding. And in sanitizing the industry, there was a security angle. And the security angle was supposed to be addressed by the police and military. And that is how come Operation Vanguard came in. But as, as I've always said, when you bring in uniformed men, we only provide enabling environment. But behind that enabling environment, there should be a political force that will chart the path to, for sustainability of the success of the fight. So if you find the soldiers and the police everywhere in Ghana, and say they are Operation Vanguard, what they are trying to do is to let people stop the illegality, to create a congenial environment for government to push through the decisions that will sanitize the mining industry. So Operation Vanguard per se is not the one that will stop Galamse. Operation Ga Vanguard is, to suppo is supposed to create an environment for government to push the policy through to stop Galamse. And how was it going to be stopped? Community mining. Operation Vanguard came in after the government says, please, can we give a break for six months? Nobody should mind. Whether you are doing small-scale mining or you are doing illegal mining, please, everybody stop. Let's review the system. We are going to train you. 
we are going to ensure that some of you get into community mining. You will come back, but at the point of coming back, you are coming back in a very decent manner. That is good for our environment. So there was a truth for six months. And after that, they brought in Operation Vanguard, saying, get in there. If you find anybody during this period of break, deal with the person. And I think I was so excited that a lot of people respected that break. Many young men stayed in the house. And when we came back, the political process was not successful enough for me. We weren't seeing the community we come, Before we come to this stage, yes. I'd like to find out whether, as a seven police officer, yeah. you were in any way involved in combating Galamse. Were you deployed in the effort to, to combat Galamse? Personally, I hadn't gotten the opportunity to get into the field. I sat at a strategic level, and all we did was to create concepts to support government policy and rule, in ruling out what we call Operation Vanguard now. So at the conceptual level, yes. At the tactical level, I have not been on the ground myself. Did you get reports from the tactical level? We had a lot of reports. What are some of those reports? When we began Operation Vanguard, in fact, at the strategic level, it was just conceptualized to ensure that this menace stops. We operationalize it, and the concept of operation has the police and military coming together to rule out or implement the policy. On the tactical level, the challenges were that many of the things that we did were because of the reviews, periodic reviews that we did on the ground. We sent police and military into the field without thinking about the possibility of prosecution. We introduced police prosecutors at a later date. Now, when the police prosecutors or investigators found their way to join Operation Vanguard, what it meant was that it has become a whole operation, but in terms of law enforcement, the police were in charge. In terms of operation on the ground, the military were in the lead. So this was an operation led by the military. But the police has a very strategic role to play in terms of investigating and prosecuting. That is how come when you go and arrest people and you take, you, 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 you seize their equipment, whether water pumping machines, whether excavators, whether pickups or pickers or whatever you get, that, those are exhibits. They were supposed to be handed over to the legally mandated body, the police. You are responsible for managing exhibit. Take over. I, I'm sure that if we had gone through this simple process of, of respecting the rules of the game, that the police has a role and the military has a role. Police do your job, military do your job. But together, we are ensuring that the objective of the president is achieved. In other words, the objective of the government is achieved. If we have followed this simple principle, nobody would have been asking the minister, Professor from Pombati, where are the excavators? They will go and ask the police, where are the, invest where are the excavators? And the police will ask the investigator. Because in police, we have something we call chain of custody of exhibit. The chain of custody of exhibit will tell you where the exhibit is. There is no way in police you come and say, oh, the exhibit is missing. That's OK. Anything can get missing. But the moment the exhibit is missing, somebody is held accountable. This is not an issue of, of, of investigating at all. You just take the docket and check. Who is the investigator? What was the exhibit involved? Oh, we had three excavators and five pumping machines. And is the case in court? Yes. Is there any court ruling? No. So the exhibits are all safe. Investigator, produce as of it. But as the work was going on, instructions went down there. Please bring all the excavators to Accra. Bring all the exhibits that you got from the scene to Accra. So it was out of the hands of the people who were in charge of the security of the operations. Nobody knew what was going on. And we created what we call Galam Stop, which was a more probably a more refined way of dealing with these exhibits. I don't know if they had the capacity to do that. And that is why we found ourselves in this mess. Beyond this, right. in 2017, when Operation Vanguard was announced, along with other measures and so on, how did you evaluate those measures? Right from the onset, I have always said that if you prescribe a security solution to a social complex. In other words, if you prescribe a security solution to a social problem, you've missed it. We've seen illegal mining as a security challenge. 
we've rated illegal mining to even the level of a national security problem. For me, if it is a national security problem, there are various components that we need to consider in prescribing the solution. If we just think that it is police and military who will go in there and chase the boys out, it is not sustainable. Because you chase them home, they go and sit in the house and there's nothing to do. Unfortunately, Galamse has its own culture. Galamse produces a culture of violence. Any young man who's been on Galamse field for three months learns how to put at least a locally manufactured weapon on himself. He learns how to put some bayonet or some, some kind of implement on himself for self-defense. Because right in there is a very violent territory. I think that I have personally visited Galamse site before I joined the police service. One of my brothers took me there, and what I saw was amazing. Because for the first time for you to go down there, thinking of whether you ever come back or not, it creates opportunity for young men to get into drug addiction. Many of them are on drugs. It's very unfortunate. But all these things, they need to be trained. If they are trained and they see that it is not dangerous to do legal mining, and it is beneficial to get involved, and it, it will have a positive impact on the environment, and nobody will come harassing them. I'm not, I'm not sure that people will be interested in getting so much into illegal mining. Well, viewers, we are talking to a retired superintendent of police. We are talking to Peter Lanchere Tubu, who is now vying for a parliamentary seat in Wild West, I suppose. That's correct. Wild West. Yeah. And we are talking about Galamse, we are talking about its impact on the economy, we are talking about measures to stop it. And he's told us about his own involvement initially in the effort to conceptualize, to develop a system for ending Galamse. We're now going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'd like to take a look at operations since 2017. Short break. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time, and uh, we are talking about Galamse, we are talking about its impact on society, we are talking about so many things. And we are talking with retired Superintendent Peter Nanchiri II. Now, sir, 2017. Yes, please. Operation Vanguard is launched. Were you still in the police service? Yes, I was. Did you play a role in it? At a strategy level, yes. What were your initial observations? Operation Vanguard, I, from my own perspective, I thought that that operation should have been led by the police. But they said it was going to be led by the military. So the police supported the military. We complemented the effort of the military. It's a joint operation, and in any general operation, there is command position. The command position in any FOB is a military officer. So the police officers were supporting them. It's not like when you talk about joint operations against armed robbery. You see the military with the police, but the police has a commanding lead. In Operation Vanguard, battle against Galamse, the military had a commanding lead. Why so? Why so? It, was, it was a strategic decision. It's, it's a political decision. There are so many things that sometimes when I hear them, I don't know, it is alleged that these Galamse people, the sight of the military alone, seeing them alone puts fear in them. And by virtue of the thing that if the military is in the forefront, the battle will be won easily. They don't look at the other components of the fact that this is an internal security matter. And if the military will back the police, all these issues of investigating and exhibit management, everything will have been done by the police and we will have a problem. So that, that command change was something I personally felt that if they had agreed to allow the police to lead the operation, 
the story would have been different today. How different would the story have been? The story would have been different because when you find a police officer leading matters of this nature, it is a crime. It has been outlawed, so whatever, it's a crime. So if it is a crime, it's a police job. If you find a military officer investigating a murder case, it doesn't matter how professional the military officer is. That is not his job. He's not been trained to investigate crime. He's been trained to protect and defend national sovereignty, but not to investigate crime. So if you find the police and military together in a national operation and it had to do with crime and the military are in the forefront, I think that is unfortunate. Well, initial reports indicated that these policemen and soldiers were actually in the field destroying equipment. They were setting excavators alight. They were destroying pickup trucks and so on. How did that come to be? Was Operation Vanguard instructed to destroy this equipment? Thank you so much. I'm just back to the point I was making. If you have an operation that is led by police, you will not find them destroying and burning things. You will find them conveying things to a center and calling them exhibits and documenting everything that is picked on the scene and finding ways to find this exhibit in court to prove a particular case. But if the military is in the lead and you find them destroying and burning things, it is normal with them. I have attended many lectures and I presented many, many, I've done many presentations in the international scene and I've always made this joke, I've always said this joke. When there is a conflict, police will only sit and watch. The fire is risen and we send our military officers. When they go there, it's not about decency. It's about bringing sanity to bear on the society. So, so many things happen. But when there is some level of peace, that is the time they send the police. And the police goes at the point that society is a bit sane. And we go to try to see if we can reconstruct life back to order. At that point in time, you realize that the police role is different from the military role. So if you go into combat and the military are in the forefront and you see them burning excavators and burning machines, for me, I will not be surprised because they're in the lead. If the police were in the lead, they would treat it as a crime. And anything that you find at the scene is an exhibit. You don't burn them. If you burn them, sometimes it will be difficult for you to prove a case. Somebody says, oh, you've taken an excavator into a, 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 an illegal area and you are mining. So it's a crime. And somebody can deny that. Why? Because I don't own an excavator. I don't even have one. That is the time you produce an excavator with all the documents and say, this particular excavator was fine on site. Who owns it? If you want to deny your own excavator, we can even prove the ownership of the excavator. That is an exhibit. But if there is no excavator, and you go to court saying that you found an excavator at the scene and the excavator was used to destroy the environment, and you don't have the exhibit to prove your case, you are weakening your case in court. So, in fact, it is a police specialized area. And I, I expect that um, reviewing this whole thing, we must fight this battle, of course. We should be able to ensure that the young men will have the job to do. The young men will get involved in decent mining. The young men will make the money that God has given us because the money is there. We are sitting on the money. But the young men should be guided. And if we fail to guide them, I'm not sure we should continue to blame them. Now excavators are not being burnt. They're getting lost. I mean, it's difficult to wrap your mind around it. I mean, excavator getting lost. How is that possible? As I was saying from the beginning, when you try to change a concept, this is a policing matter, and you make it a military matter. And instead of even making a military matter, you made it a civilian matter. Many of the excavators that were brought to a center in Accra or wherever they kept them, I don't know, they were not in the custody of the police, neither were they in the custody of the leaders of the operation, the military. The police and the military have no idea where the excavators were. So who was managing what? Let me say this. If a police officer who is an investigator is in charge of a case and one piece of exhibit is missing, the first thing we do you are interdicted. I'm sure it was a police sergeant or a police constable or a police inspector somewhere who was managing a case with about 10, 15 excavators and one excavator is missing. He would have been on interdiction now. 
and you will be asked to produce it. Somebody must be held accountable. Today, the police are not part, the military are not part. Somebody else is managing exhibits. I, I, I've not seen this practice in any law enforcement agents before in the world, that somebody else, another entity is managing exhibits, and the police is in charge of investigations, and the military is in charge of the whole overall operation. This is a total confusion. Who are these somebody else's who are responsible for, for, for keeping inventory? Politicians were responsible. I've, I've, I've heard of a call. You see the Central Regional Deputy um, Chairman of the MPP? He was made to be in charge. It's, it's official that like he was made to be in charge. And I was wondering, why would a civilian come and take charge of exhibits? What are his experiences? Is he a police officer? Why is it so? But all of us were watching. Probably they knew something that we didn't know. But I was saying, if there's nothing that they know better, the end I am seeing now wouldn't surprise any of us. And we are seeing it. It's an embarrassed situation. It's embarrassing to the government, embarrassing to Ghanaians, that we have a whole security setup. It's an operation that is designed. We have goals. Yet, somebody gives instructions. And this order from above type of mentality. Order from above, bring the exhibits to Accra. And you brought the exhibits to Accra. And you can't question, where are the exhibits? No, but how were the case being investigated? But who made that decision that, that seized items? And, and seized items, you're not just talking about excavators. Yeah. You're talking about raw gold. You're talking about weapons. Yeah. You're talking about other vehicles and implements and so on. Who made the decision? that these should be taken over by civilian party loyalists who made that decision? That strict answer I cannot give. But what I know is that we started with the ministry. Okay? Honorable Peter Mew was in charge. And all of a sudden, they created an interministerial committee. And I thought that that interministerial committee was supposed to probably enhance the operations and make it more effective probably ensure that funding was quick to be released. The interministerial committee came into force. It was a whole body. And all of a sudden, what was on the ground was not the best if you talk to the officers. I've spoken to many of them and they tell me, well, you know, this is a political decision. Fighting Galamse is a political decision. It's just like peacekeeping. You go in there, your job is to keep the peace. But what, keep, what peace are you keeping? It's a peace that was created by a political process. So if the political process is strong, the, the, the role of the peacekeepers will enhance some kind of sanity in society. But if the political process is not strong, you can actually stay in that mission theater for 10 years, and you wouldn't have any peace. So it was a political decision. And why they decided to order or give instructions for the exhibit to be brought and put under the supervision or management of a civilian beats my imagination. But all of us have lessons to learn. Today we are looking at it that the fight against Galamse is a failure. There is something I put on my uh, WhatsApp status, I think three days ago. Any time in battle, any time you begin to desire the booty, defeat is imminent. Any time you begin to desire the booty in battle, defeat stares at your face. All of us are witnesses to what happened. That people who were fighting Galamse began to get what they want to get even from the Galamse. So it wasn't about fighting Galamse anymore. It was about making money. And I wasn't surprised to hear my senior brother, Honorable Kennedy at Japan, saying that some officers even contact him, pleading with him if he could find a way to let them take part in Operation Vanguard. Because you make more money than going to a UN peacekeeping mission. And you think it was just an allegation. I'm not sure Honorable Kennedy at Japan will come and make such a, a statement on air if he doesn't have the fact. But the fact is that people were looking at the booty. They were not looking at the objectives of the operation. And as I've always said, if you begin to desire the booty, forget about success in the, in the, in the, in the fight against Galamse. And that is the embarrassment. People have, people have taken excavators away as if it's just granada sharing. They sold some at very serious prices. You, you can't imagine. And some of them are missing. Somebody says, even when Guinea fowls were flying, we were very shocked. 
if they did fly at all. Today, excavators without wings, they can't even move on their own. They are disappearing. And we say we will investigate it. I expected to see the president fire a lot of people by now. Just fire according to what? People should be accountable. Stay out of your office and let the investigation go on. But you, we are trying to massage a lot of stuff because we agree that we have failed. There is no way we can succeed in this. We have to re-strategize. If we are re-strategizing, somebody should be held responsible for the failure. Unless the president wants to agree that, yes, I think they have taken personal responsibility. But he appointed people to do the job. If they are not doing the job right, please fire them. It's simple as that. Are, are you one of those people who thinks that uh, Operation Vanguard and all of them have failed? We have failed Operation Vanguard. Ghana has failed Operation Vanguard. And let me explain it this way. When you send uniform officers onto the field at the tactical level, they take instructions. But because this was a political battle, the instruction will end at the political level. The interministerial committee is a strategic head of that operation. Whatever instruction comes out from the interministerial committee will roll down to the tactical level. There is something that we have to say as a country and say it very clearly. You have the soldier and the policeman to be jumping through the forest, some of them falling into, into ditches and getting hurt and all that, to ensure that Ghana remains very sane in terms of the fight against Galamse. And all of a sudden, the soldiers and police sit in the forest, realizing that the people at the top who are motivating us, they are sharing excavators like granite. And they say, oh, really? <laughs> you don't use us. We are too smart to be used. We don't use the police and use the army. No. You ask them, and they have a responsibility to protect the country. They have a responsibility to serve Ghana. And they are very honest. They are very loyal. But if at a strategic level, they are seeing that there is no commitment to the fight, we are all human beings. If the president is not committed, why should the private soldier or the constable be committed? If the minister who is in charge of this interministerial committee is not showing signs of commitment, that when there is a sign of corruption, we don't see them fighting it. All of a sudden, if I can't win this battle, I think I need to join them. So when you find a lot of soldiers or police allegedly joining in this rot, it wasn't because they went in there and were initially corrupt. No. They went in there very professional. But they realized that the strategic direction is a corrupted direction. So either you join them or you risk your life for nothing. And that is how come I say we have failed Operation Vanguard. And having failed them, they messed up. And I think that they have left their usefulness. Now the police is being asked to investigate what has happened. What capacity does the police have to investigate? That is a question I ask myself. The police are part of the operations. It's a joint military or police operation. What is the concept? For me, I think that we should have had a serious committee, some by, by, what is it, bipartisan committee to look at the failure. It's not, it's not an ordinary matter for the police to investigate. Police, what are they investigating? They are investigating to find out where the exhibits are, who was responsible, and so on. The whole issue is that this is a whole national fight against a serious matter, Galamse. And we have failed. We've embarrassed ourselves as a nation. Can we have some bipartisan body to review the whole concept? And let's look at the way forward. Police investigation, for me, I have my own reservations. And I, I, I just wonder what will the essence be? Prosecute who? When they are prosecuted many during the operations, and we have never heard of any as a better owner, we only arrest the young, young ones and send them to court, jail them two, three months, and sometimes we find them and they pay and they go. They go and go back to the site. But the huge people, in other words, the masters behind the scene, their cover is never blown. And until we get there, where the big fishes are dealt with, this piecemeal staff investigating just to be able to show that we've done something. When in fact we all know as a country that there is a lot underneath. If we don't dig deeper and bring the rot out, let's continue to do the piecemeal. The fight against Galancy will never be won. Does the tape recording 
allegedly done by Ekwa Wuzi not provide some important leads in the investigation? There is enough to start with from Ekwa Wuzi's team. But because the police had a role to play right from the beginning of the operations, I was always prepared to, 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 I mean, for some level of impartiality to prevail in the investigations, we could have a body to deal with this matter. It's now it's no longer just a criminal matter. Police, our job is to investigate crime or prevent it. What are we investigating? This is a whole operation that has failed. So it's not just the crime aspect of it. The whole operation has failed. Let's give it a national approach. Get a serious body, a bipartisan body, to review. The government paper on the operation was good enough. If you look at the policy, it's, it's brilliant. Why did it fail? It failed at the implementation stage. How can we make it better? Should we just throw our hands in the air? No. We have to do something as a country. Or else, Venice will start importing water from Burkina Faso. I'm using Burkina Faso as an example. You live in Ghana, you can import water from a desert country. It tells us that there is something wrong with our thinking. And I've always said that I, I don't believe this statement that the black man is somehow mentally inferior. I don't believe it to be true. Sometimes we are just reckless. We can do things better. If we fail, and so what? Let's agree that it is a failure, and let's agree that we need to review it, and let's agree that after reviewing all of us as Ghanaians, let's chart the path and let everybody support it. I'm sure that we can win this battle. Important question, maybe from the mentor. Is the Ghana Police Service able to investigate sitting ministers and other political heavyweights? Thank you very much. Um, I will refer to a presentation that was made by Dr. Benjamin Agojo about the fact that politics in policing does not help police professionalism. If we get to a stage in this country where a minister of state will respect the police constable, we have been deemed to have arrived. Where a minister of state can be invited by a detective constable because there is an allegation that he needed to clear. We will have deemed to have arrived. But when we have a political heavy top, the whole police council is a political body on its own. And it's that political body that is providing support to the inspector general of police who is responsible for the daily administration of the Ghana Police Service. And the fact is that if the president sleeps and wakes up, I've always said this, the only position I never envied while I was in the Ghana Police Service was the position of the Inspector General of Police. Why? Because he's the only police officer who comes to work in the morning and can go back as a retired police officer. Within two hours, it's just a phone call. You are fired and you have become a retired IGP. But nobody can fire me like that. So you are in the police service and you are enjoying yourself. The day you become Inspector General of Police, you are half civilian and half police. And who determines you become civilian the next minute is just one person, the president. So where is the security? In such a situation, where do you, what, what gut do you have to go and investigate a sitting minister of state? Who can have a one-on-one -on -one with the president and you are fired the next minute? When he's telling the president something about you, you may not be there to say, oh, Mr. President, your excellency, it's not true or it's true. You will be fired without knowing. And before the president gets to realize that, no, I was misinformed. In other words, I was misled, as the president has been misled on so many things. But you've been fired already. So because of that lack of security of tenure, people sit on that seat and they are cautious. And I've said this, no inspector general of police can transform the Ghana police service without a president with a political will to get a powerful police organization in this country. How do we provide the security of tenure? How can we provide the security of tenure? The law hasn't given us that opportunity to provide the security of tenure. We need to go back to the law. We need to go back to the Constitution. We need to look at the Police Act. I'm sure if we review many of these things, we can have best practices around the globe. Go to Kenya. It's, it's, a, it's a whole changing game. If the president can appoint an IGP, like the way it's done with, with the judiciary, the chief justice, he appoint the IGP, and even if it's a three-year tenure, or a two-year tenure, or a four-year tenure, until something serious happens, you cannot be removed from office. I'm sure you begin to see changes from the top. Because even the IGP, 
you can be fired tomorrow. So why will I risk my job? And you know, in Africa, we don't resign on principles. Hardly do we do that. So it's all about butter and bread. So if you butter my bread, I will not bite your finger. Because if you bite my finger, I throw you out. So basically, we have to look at the laws again. The laws have made it said that the president is very powerful, and the president appoints and disappoints at will. Sometimes someone will say even capricious, because he's not supposed to give any reason. If he finds an IG, does he give any reason? The IGP has been changed. A new one has been appointed. Mr. President, why? I am not accountable to anybody in these matters. The Constitution empowers me to do that. I'm not supposed to, account to, to, to give reasons or advance reasons for my actions. And that's it. If you find yourself in such a position, I think that it's only human for you to always be cautious and not to be stepping on toes saying that you want to be a hero. You will lose your job within one month. So you would recommend some constitutional changes? I would recommend strongly some constitutional changes that was to give, give the police some level of autonomy that the, the, the RGP once appointed cannot be at the whims and caprices of the president. Well, viewers, we're taking another short break from this obviously interesting conversation about Galamse, or is it Galam Stop or Operation Vanguard? Short break. Hello? Okay, uh, my wife is going to send a message to you. Hey, your face is going to move away. Hello? Hey, no, go so. What's happened? It's your child. I'm going to go to the house. What's up? I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. Uh-huh. I was not testing messages here. And now, officials, so I'm just trying to tell you, man. She's just a man. I'm in him, so we're a guy, man. And my young who could look right. And so, also, want a family drilling company limited for Kana. Who's it? Family drilling company limited. Yet, to borrow biofuel, biogas, swimming pool, plumbing works in the Nassau. Yeah, yeah, be Friday 0240. 333111 <laughs> 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 talking about Galamse and its implications and its various dimensions and so on. And we are privileged to be talking to retired Superintendent Peter Nachi Lanchene, Lanchene uh, mm -hmm. Tubu, retired police officer. Now, sir, if you look at the whole operation, you tend to get the impression that it was a national security operation. Is that right? That is correct. And that is why I said, because they rated it to be a national security issue, they gave it to the military. So the military were in need, and the police were supposed to support. But if you have seen it as a criminal matter, that we are trying to reduce this particular crime, deal with it as a criminal matter, the police should have been in the lead. That is why we don't have soldiers leading operations against armed robbery. We don't so just leading that. It is the police that lead. Operation against armed robbery is a joint military police operation that the police are in the lead. This one was seen as a national security matter. In fact, a national security threat. So they brought the soldiers in. But for me, I think I say things from hand side. If we had put the police in a better perspective to manage the police aspect of the operation effectively, this embarrassing situation would never have emerged. But that is where we are. Sometimes we need to just trust institutions and give them the opportunity to function and function according to the law. If they fall short, we draw their attention or query them. Now, if it was a national security operation, how come that it was being led by ministers and not ministers of interior and national security as well, minister of mines, minister of environment, and so on? And, and, and party bigwigs, how come? Doesn't that devalue the, the, the concept of a national security operation? Thank you very much. I think that is why I said we have failed Operation Vanguard. Operation Vanguard never failed. Operation Vanguard 
is a group of professional police and military officers put at the tactical level to execute attacks. The conceptual stage, the strategic stage, was managed by politicians. And we don't have a problem with that. The political direction must come. Because this is, this is a government promise. It's a campaign promise that must be achieved. So the political direction must come. But in executing the tax at the tactical level, we don't want too much political interference. And that has brought this operation down. Too much political interference without understanding the nuances of security operations at the tactical level has brought this disgrace. And I've always said this. If you find yourself at the strategic level, and you take so much interest in what happens at the tactical level, you commit what we call structural suicide. You, you want to be in the field. There are soldiers and police who are in the field trying to prevent this thing from happening. And you are a minister. You are a party big wig. You are supposed to be part of government. And you want to find yourself also in the forest, snatching equipment and taking excavators and sharing amongst other people and selling some of them. You've gotten to be part of the tactical level and you have caused a strategic mess. And that is how can we fail. If the soldiers and the policemen were allowed with their own professional acumen to deal with the situation, we wouldn't have gotten this. But the interferences were too many to manage. And you know, in uniform you can't talk. If there is a, a bipartisan committee and you have the soldiers and the police to come and open up and tell you what happened, I'm sure this country, all of us will rise to say, if this is the kind of democracy that we want, probably it is the only system that has come to enhance corruption. It is sad. Now we know we have failed. At least many people believe that we have failed. You can see the color of the rivers. Yes. You can see the devastation of, of the forest and so on. Where do we go from here? One recommendation. Let's all agree that we failed. Some of us are speaking like this. Somebody will say, who said we failed? I it's know. obvious we have it's failed. It's obvious. And if you deny it, even the, the water color will expose you. Go anywhere and think that, oh, we have succeeded in our fight against Galamsi. And I was surprised that when the minister was interviewed, he said, if you want me to assess myself, I would say I have succeeded by 70%. I said, wow, 70%. What are, the, what are the indicators? What are the variables that like you are looking at? That you, you believe that you've done 70% of the job. And the color of the water bodies, from brim to pra, is exposing everybody in this country that the fight against Galamse is a total failure. We intended well. We didn't arrive well. Let's sit back, reflect. First, agree that we have failed. That's the first thing. If we stay in the denial stage, we can never go anywhere. Let's agree that we failed, sit back as a country, not even as a government. Let's sit back as a country. This is a serious national matter. NDC coming to power 2021 is assured. But if we don't sit as a country and NDC comes to power in 2021 and also decide to make it an NDC government matter, we will still have a challenge. Ghana, let's rise to the occasion. This is a serious national matter, and all of us should come together. Let's forget about these partisan things. Our water bodies are being destroyed. The president cannot do it. He has failed. Let's come and support him, and let's find another way. There is a way out. Because in innovation, what we say is that if you repeat a particular practice over and over, and you don't like the results, and you want to continue from that angle, it's a very charitable definition of insanity. And I don't think that that is the way we all want to go. We can do something better. There are still a lot of ideas out there that we can employ to make this fight against Galamse a very successful one. One thing I want us to liken to the battle against Galamse, if you go to UN peacekeeping operations, the soldiers are there, like Operation Vanguard. These are the men in the field. They are trying to ensure that society remains sane. But behind the scene, there is a strong political process that is driving the country towards a very peaceful settlement. And when that is done, you don't need the soldiers. You don't need the blue beret. Again, let's treat this matter as a serious matter and give ourselves four, five, six years with well-planned strategies, timelines, and monitor ourselves. I'm sure that at the end of that time, we'll begin to see that as Ghanaians, we have realized that, yes, we have to mine. The young men must mine. That one we have to underline. Allow them to mine. But please, can we find a way to let them do it decently? that they don't affect our environment, and they don't destroy our water bodies, but they also earn a living. So this is a balancing act. Go sucking young people from mining sites, telling them to go and sit in the house when there is no hope 
is creating tension in society. They will find a way to do other things that are more injurious to society. And for me, the time to think Ghanaian is now. Well, thank you very much for coming to the studio. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Well, viewers, we've been talking about Galam Say, we've been talking about Galam Stop, we've been talking about Operation Vanguard, we've been talking about the implications of all of that on the national life, on the forest, and everything. Um, we are privileged to have in the studio with us retired Superintendent Peter Nancini Tubo who was involved in the conceptual stage, you know, of developing a strategy for fighting Galamse. We all heard him. We all heard his conclusion about the failures and what we may do in, ever, in order to, to, to protect the environment and so on. Well, this is typical Pan-African television. And Pan-African television is always bringing you the best. Please don't move your dial. Stay on Pan African Television until we meet again next week. It's goodbye from the producer director, this time Darren, uh, from Sewa, behind the cameras with others, and from all of us at Pan African Television. Bye bye. <laughs>